Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Every single one of you in this room has very, very definite attitudes toward every phase of alcohol. Toward alcoholics, toward alcoholism, even toward drinking, toward drunkenness. In fact, toward alcohol itself. Our attitudes come from our parents, from our religious background, our cultural background, but above all else from our contact with some alcoholic. Every one of you knows an alcoholic. In fact, at least five of you live with one actively drinking. In fact, if there are a minimum of three active alcoholics here. Face it, that's just a statistic. So many of us will die from cancer. So many of us will die from other things. So many of us will die in accidents. So many of us will die of alcoholism. A fact, it is the number one health problem in the United States. Hugh Downs on the Today Show is the only other man besides myself who has ever had the nerve publicly to say that he firmly believes, as do I, that there are a minimum of 18 million alcoholics. Every one of whom affects it seriously, affects a minimum of six other people. Good heavens, industry calls it the billion dollar hangover. But let's, let's examine some of the background sources of our attitudes. We are all right here products of the so-called temperance movement that was born in the United States about a century ago. They went very quickly from temperance to abstinence. Because, you see, they went from a condemnation of alcoholism and alcoholics to the next very logical step, condemnation of drinking, and then those who drink. And then a kind of insanity. Intelligent people passed a moralistic judgment on an inanimate object. Alcohol is evil. And some of us were raised with that notion. This is very intimately wrapped up in our religious background. Orthodox Jews hardly know what you're talking about when you mention alcoholism. They are raised, one, with proper attitudes, and two, they do not tolerate drunkenness. You get drunk once as a Jew, then you're accused of being drunk like a Gentile. Race, let's take the Jews. They are raised almost from birth and have been for centuries on wine. The American Indian had no past cultural usage of alcohol. He was a sitting duck for alcoholism. We're all here old enough to remember the Saturday afternoon B-movies. The Chiefs called it firewater. The West was not one with the Winchester rifles, one with barrels of whiskey. There wasn't Bill Cody and Bat Masterson and Wyatt Earp and uh, Wild Bill Hickok conquered the West. It was Jim Beam and I.W. Harper and old granddad and a few of those fellas. Uh... Let's take this aspect of it. Islam forbids the use of alcohol. American Mormonism forbids the use of alcohol. Of Arabians who drink, one out of three becomes an alcoholic, and of Mormons, one out of two, because those who drink, drink with guilt. The attitudes in this country, good heavens, go to a football or baseball game and watch the reactions to a drunk. There is no single reaction. Some people laugh nervously. Others say, isn't that funny? Et cetera, et cetera. Dean Martin says whiskey, and everybody falls apart laughing. The Jew just sits astonished at such a thing. You know, would you laugh when automobile is mentioned? <clears throat> but again, above all else, our attitudes are formed basically by our contact with some alcoholic. Uh, there's a nurse in Baltimore who has done about 12 years of work in emergency rooms. Her definition, which she gave at a seminar about two years ago, what's an alcoholic? Hers was this, an alcoholic is my uncle. No parents, she was raised by an aunt and uncle. The uncle was an alcoholic, he was also the world's worst. Wife beater, child beater, and so on. Significant was this, that's what she saw. Every time a sick alcoholic was wheeled in the emergency room, that's the way she treated him. Alcoholism is the oldest disease known to mankind. It is the most complex and the most devastating. It affects every single facet of the human person, body, mind, emotions, and soul. 
has the illness about which we know the least. Face it, ladies and gentlemen, what you know is what you see. And what you see is alcoholic behavior. And face it, it's obnoxious. What we don't see is what we don't see of an iceberg. What's hidden. Most of us are enamored of causes. Now, with this in mind, and we waste billions on psychiatric treatment, which is given and received at the wrong time. I'll discuss that a little later. But what happens is this. Our reasoning says, if he knows why he drinks, the problem will disappear. Now, let me ask you this. Any of you ever go to a dentist? Doctor, this tooth is killing. Tell me why it hurts. You don't. Get the drill. Get the drill. Make it stop hurting. You may indeed know the, the molecular structure of all the goop that goes into your mouth and, and the composition of enamel and pulp and dentin and everything else and the interaction of the two. So what? That does not make it stop hurting. And knowing why he drinks doesn't make an alcoholic stop drinking. After he has stopped properly, knowing why he drinks may keep him sober. But it has little or nothing to do with getting him that way. But again, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, of the 18 million alcoholics in this country, there are about a half million sober ones. The fact, one out of 36 gets well, the other 35 die. They just die. So what we're here for this morning is to find out a little bit about alcohol, and then about alcoholism. And as was indicated, the information is not my, I can boast of it because it is not my own. It came from a little doctor who was himself a recovered alcoholic. He lost everything because of his drinking, beginning with his license to practice medicine. From there he went down. And he wound up in the gutter on Michigan Avenue in Detroit. But he got well, and he went back to the top of his profession with this difference. He dedicated the remaining years of his medical life to the treatment of alcoholic patients, and he treated over 6,000 of them. Now, this little man knew what he was talking about. And even though the problem is complex, the answers are very simple indeed. And I hope that just as I was, you would be impressed by the genius of this man's simplicity. I think that in this realm, our brains get in our way. I have noticed this personally in AA. I have met many people too smart to get sober. I've never met one too stupid to. Never. The trouble with the human animal is his brains get in his way often. Anyway, Doc Green used to begin at the beginning. The things we drink and why, it is important to know. The first thing that crosses human lips is water, and it is drunk to fulfill a need. Slake's thirst. It's drunk for the simplest of reasons. The second thing is milk, and it too is drunk to fulfill a need, the maintenance of health. Do you remember from your high school biology classes, the scientist classifies us as milk drinkers. That's what we're called in textbooks. We are mammals, from the Latin word mama, breast, the source of milk. These two beverages, since necessary, are quite natural, but we drink other things for other reasons. We're introduced, usually when we are young, because of a preference for sweetness in the taste buds of the very young, for something sweet. Soft drink, hot chocolate, cocoa, anything. And the reason, again, is a simple one. It's different from these two, but it is still simple. Did you ever notice that most professions or disciplines have their own jargon and vocabulary with which they try to dazzle the rest of the world with their intellectual footwork? Uh, you know what the scientist says? This is drunk for oral gratification. Now, that's a seven-cent phrase. It means it tastes good. <laughs> and that's exactly why it is drunk. It pleases a desire. It simply tastes good. Then we come to the first beverage. It contains a drug, coffee. And the drinking of coffee is learned. You know why we have to learn to drink it? It's not necessary. It doesn't taste good. Well, why in the world do we learn to drink such a thing? Well, the first reason is the simplest of all, curiosity. The big people drink it and don't give us any. And when we get old enough to ask, we're told we can't have it. When we ask why, they say it's not good for us, so we want some. So somebody will take a little coffee, cut it with milk or cream, add a little sugar to make it somewhat pleasing to taste, take a sip, you're doing just what the big people do. That's your first step out of infancy, is drinking a big people beverage. 
Custom dictates its use. Just as tea is drunk in other countries, coffee is drunk here. In fact, the coffee break is so customary that I think it's written into some labor contracts. And then there is this social aspect that is hardly definable, this business of conviviality. By the way, I hope you noticed I was talking while I was writing that word. Many people think that great achievements consist in degrees after your name or, or promotions and so on. I consider that a major achievement in my life. It took me three years to learn to do that, to keep the... No, anyway, then we come to alcohol. <clears throat> the drinking of which is also learned. But to get to this conviviality thing, I, I skip it. It's the coffee break. You are not thirsty. A sip of water takes care of that. But everybody else is sitting around, conversing and exchanging ideas. And so you have a cup of coffee, too. There is a social aspect to the drinking of coffee at certain times. Alcohol is not necessary and doesn't taste good. We acquire a taste for it, just as we acquire a taste for raw oysters or, or olives or whatever. Some people drink until they die, never having acquired a taste for it. What are the reasons that are given for drinking alcohol? There are external and internal pressures, both of which are strong. The first is curiosity. Again, the big people drink it and don't give us any. We're told it's not good for us and so on and so forth. Somewhere along the line, somebody's going to take a little whiskey, cut it with water or ice, add a little sugar to sweeten it, a little garbage to color it, take a sip, we're doing just what the big people do. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I presume that most of those are fairly intelligent. We educate our kids to think this way. We do it with our sophisticated 20th century law when you're 21 and you drink. That's why half of you here, and perhaps most of your kids, will sneak out of a prom to take a drink of beer or whiskey. They never dream of doing this with a Coke. We've educated them to think that way. It's the big people drink. It's the big shot thing to do. And that contributes to attitude. <laughs> Custom dictates its use. Before men knew how to write, that's the way they made contracts. Your drink was binding, just as was a handshake, just as is a signature. Um, it's customary to drink at births and deaths and weddings. We toast the bride in champagne. Wakes, holidays, celebrations, graduations, holy days, feast days, fast days, Sundays, Mondays, Tuesdays, <laughs> Wednesdays. <laughs> you know, down the line, it's customary to drink. And conviviality, important, vastly important. Uh, and it's far more conducive to conviviality than all the coffee grown. Take a room full of, let's say, 75 people, and you don't know each other too well. Everybody's a little stiff, <sighs> pardon the expression, and formal. Circulate a couple of gallons of martinis and stick your head in the same room about an hour or so later. Everybody is about as convivial as they can be and they're quite at ease with each other. There's a biochemical reason why that is so, and we'll see it in a minute. Alcohol is drunk for escape. Now, forget all the background ins and outs of psychiatric reasoning. I'm talking about normal people with normal problems. You want to get away from them? Take three and a half, four martinis. The problems are still there, but they don't bother you now. And there's a biochemical reason why that is so. And for those who can take it, it's marvelous. Here in the United States, about one out of eight will become alcoholic. The other seven can drink until their death, enjoying it. In fact, Scripture refers to wine as the gift of God that gladdens the hearts of men. Tensions, frustrations, anxieties, jobs, husbands, wives. Take three drinks and just settle back for a couple hours. It's wonderful. Pain is a reason given. In fact, uh, beer and wine have been beverages from the beginning. Distillation, what produces whiskey and gin and the, the so-called hard stuff, wasn't discovered until fairly recently in the history of man. And when it came into being, it was used as medication only. But now it's a beverage, and I strongly suspect people who use pain as their reason for drinking. So what did you get drunk last night for? When you get an answer like receding gums, you know there's trouble. <laughs> there's trouble. There was a fellow in AA over in Baltimore, he over 17 years. Now, when he was drinking and couldn't make it into work, he called in and said, i got to go to the dentist, get a tooth out. He was sober about a year, and he and his boss were talking about his drinking. And the boss opened his desk room, pulled out a sheet of paper, he said, Ross, you know, when you were drinking, he said, you had 75 teeth extracted. <laughs> <laughs> Here's what I mean by Dr. Green's simplicity. Euphoria is why the human animal drinks alcohol. 
word. That's a 32 cent Greek word that means a sense of well-being. This is why you spend two dollars for a cocktail. You could buy a case of orange for the same price. But that little old glass with two ounces of booze in it does what all the orange in the world can't do. makes you feel good. Here's where he used to argue by the hour, by the week, by the month, and by the year with his medical colleagues. The answer is just too simple to be true. I demand complexity. It isn't true at all. Now, why do you want to feel good? Now, you can fill psychiatric libraries, but that's why the human animal drinks alcohol. Now, fascinatingly enough, the chemistry of alcohol. Don't let this scare you. Alcohol is a chemical composed of carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. I know no chemistry. I flunked it in college. I know that H2O is water and K9P comes from the south end of a dog, and that ends my knowledge of formula. <laughs> Alcohol is not a food and has no food properties. There are no minerals, no vitamins, no proteins. In fact, the stomach can't digest it. The stomach digests what it's in. Beer, for example, is about 5 6% alcohol. The rest of it is food stuff. But the alcohol itself is not digested. It's oxidized by the liver. But anyway, basically it's a solvent and one of the best in the world. It'll remove stains from tables, tables, stomachs, uh, bankrolls, marriages, jobs, friendships, and lives. It's the best. It's erroneously looked upon as a stimulant because of the wacky things people do when they drink it. I would guess that at least a fistful of you think alcohol stimulates because of what people do when they get a couple. But it isn't. It's an antiseptic. A nurse purifies arms or legs or wherever she wants to stick needles before she sticks the needle in. For centuries, it was the only anesthetic that mankind had. It's a poor one, and we'll see why. When wine was offered to Christ on the cross, it was meant as an act of simple human kindness. Cheap wine was standard equipment in the execution kits of the, of the Romans who killed people by crucifixion. Basically, in its drinkable form, alcohol is a sedative drug, and alcoholism is addiction to it. Now, that's the whole morning in a sentence. Alcohol is a sedative drug, and alcoholism is addiction to it. I maintain firmly and strongly we know nothing of addiction. Nothing. The only thing we can do is describe it. That's all. And treat it. But what it is, God knows. And usually he won't tell. All addiction is characterized by compulsive use of the addictive substance. And that's why the drinker that you know drinks the way he does. He doesn't will it. He drinks that way against his will. Would that he could handle it. That's his problem. He tries to handle it. He can't. Now, addiction is progressive, and once contracted, it progresses until death, even though you can stop or arrest the addiction. The addiction is still there, and it worsens when it is gone back to. Here, I think, is Dr. Green's genius. He does the obvious. He shows that alcohol is a sedative drug by comparing its action with that of an accepted anesthetic drug, ether. Which, like all sedatives, interferes with the oxygen supply to the brain and puts it to sleep. The brain, as you know, is an organ composed of parts that control functions. I realize this is simplistic for any of you who may be connected with medicine, but this is the way it was presented to us, it's the way we understood it, it's the way I pass it on to you. The outermost part of the brain houses reason, the intellect. Beneath that, the emotions, the imagination, the memory. Deeper still is that part controlling your motor activity, the movement of parts, your arms and legs. There are the semi-voluntary functions, like the blinking of your eyes. At times you have control over it, at times a gust of wind, you blink involuntarily. There are purely involuntary functions, the action of your stomach and your intestines. And then from the Latin word vita, life, there are those functions essential to life, which we call vital, your heartbeat and your breathing. Now, the brain goes to sleep from outside in. It can be done almost instantaneously, but step by step, that's the way it goes out. 
Everybody here also has some notion, and correct, I'm sure, of adulthood or maturity. An adult is somebody with a sense of responsibility, or one who tries to fulfill a sense of responsibility. An adult is someone sensitive to the sensitivities of other people. According to Newman's classic definition of a gentleman, one who does not consciously cause pain. Dr. Green's definition, one who functions this way. According to the formula I over E, his intellect controls his emotions. Going along with the entire school of scholasticism founded by Aquinas, man is a rational animal. Now let's see what happens to that formula when the brain that controls it is interfered with by adding a drug to it. First of all, there's a dryness in the throat. It's highly absorbent of moisture. It dries out those mucous membranes. And you get this big sense of suffocation. You want to rip the mask off and gulp fresh air. But before you can do that, you feel good. Get the picture. You have just left your room, clad in what is euphemistically called a hospital gown. Uh, I think they're obscene, personally. Then they put you on a hard metal cart, and guess how you get to the operating room? No one, no one has ever explained to me from hospital designer, administrator, doctor, or nurse, why in the most modern hospital where they perform surgery all day, every day, there's no such thing as an elevator for surgical patients. You go down on the public elevator. Now, that was about three or four clowns that were on you <laughs> as you go down. Then they wheel you into the operating room where there are six ghouls, and they're standing there in cap, mask, and gown, and guess what color? You know, some psychologists have earned their doctorates writing theses on color and how it affects morale and so on and so forth. After 92,000 laundrings, these hospital gowns now are vomit green. And you're there with an empty belly at 8.10. And then the fellow who used to be your friend the night before walks in this way. They're going to stick a knife in his hand. He's going to stick it in your belly in about 30 seconds, and you couldn't care less. If the nurse would have bend over and say, you know, we're going to have to remove that whole arm, you say, take them both, I've got legs. <laughs> you would. It doesn't bother you. And the reason is the simplest in the world. The first part of the brain that is hit is what would make you feel bad. Reason. It's now gone. In fact, they give you a needle before you leave the room. You're half flaky by the time you get down there. So it's I over E except after D. Add a drug and watch what you get. This is highly important. Control over the emotions is now gone. What happens is they come out. You have a reversal of the formula and immediately enter an excitement stage. <coughs> Now, with your motor activity affected, since you could harm yourself, that's why that sheet's wrapped rather tightly around you, and that's why the medical personnel are now standing close to you. Watch this. The emotions have come out. This is why you say wacky things. This is also why medical ethics forbids them to bear outside that room what you bear inside it. And the reason is the simplest in the world. When the emotions come out, they do not come out, let's say, normal. There is such a thing. They come out drug affected because that's the next part of the brain hit. They come out drug affected. Now let me ask you a question that might sound silly and stupid, but it's very valid. How many of you listening to a patient babble on a table in an operating room would say, good heavens, he needs a psychiatrist? What would you think of psychiatrists who go wandering from operating room to operating room trying to apply psych psychiatric care? You said they need help themselves and you'd be right. But just bear that in mind for a minute. You may or may not get sick. That's neither here nor there. Since these two things are dangerous, they try to slam you through them as quickly as they can. There is, however, a nurse there with a basin to catch anything you have to offer. Uh, normally there won't be. They keep that entire intestinal tract empty. Uh, beginning the night before, by use of the most sophisticated medical technique known to God and man. Uh, it's called the enema, is, is what it's called and could. Personally, I think it's inhumane and barbaric, but I don't know of any other way. I had six in, in three days one time. I was in for a complete checkup. 
And uh, by the fourth, when that fellow walked in with the fourth enema, I saluted him. <laughs> downstairs, I called him the rear admiral of the fourth floor. I, that to me is is uh, as irritating as the surgery itself, really. But when the semi-voluntary functions go, you are in pre-anesthesia, simple unconsciousness. You cannot yet be cut. When the involuntary functions go, you are in anesthesia and can undergo surgery. The next step is obvious. The only thing left is your heartbeat and your breathing. And I have heard every surgeon who has ever been to one of these meetings has always come up afterwards. He says, I wish the heavens people would realize that despite the nature of the surgery, if you undergo any surgery by general anesthesia in which your brain is sedated down to here, there's no such thing as minor surgery. You're as close to death as you will ever be. This is why to keep a person between anesthesia and death because death results when the vital functions go, it was highly dangerous indeed. Most anesthesiologists are MDs who do nothing but this. Coming out of it, you go through the same process in reverse. From anesthesia to pre-anesthesia, you'll be sick and undergo an excitement stage. Ether is terribly conducive to nausea. This is why they use anything else they can. And part of the sickness, particularly after abdominal surgery, is this phenomenon called gas. Oh. Do, those of you who have experienced it know what I mean. And if you haven't experienced it, you can only imagine. In the middle of the first day after surgery, you are afraid you might die, and in the middle of the second one, you're afraid you might not. And I'm dead serious about that, too. You do not care if the next minute of your life shows up or not. And you know what happens? Uh, a surgeon friend of mine explained, he says, you come to, but they don't for about three days. This is why they try to get you ambulatory, why they try to get you to eat, and so on, as soon after surgery as possible, to activate those things. What causes the pain is the distinction of the intestines caused by gas. You can cut an intestine without feeling it hardly, but just distend it ever so slightly, which is what a cramp is, and, and the pain is almost unbearable. Now, watch. Standard medical procedure. You go to recovery room, till you're conscious, then back to your own room, and as soon as this team of usually about four or five pros gets you back in the bed in almost a split second, the first procedure performed is a massive dose of morphine. It's to prevent hurting yourself in the excitement stage, and also, and quite obviously, to alleviate the pain. Now, there will not be any euphoria for obvious reasons. Now watch. I have never ceased to be impressed by this. Cross out ether, substitute alcohol, it does exactly the same thing. Ladies and gentlemen, please remember this. As such, this has nothing to do with alcoholism. This has to do with alcohol, what it does when you drink it. Uh, a biochemist showed me this about a month ago. To get ether, what you do is you take two alcohol molecules. Here's one. Now watch, H, O, C, 2, H, 5, and you remove the water, H, 2, O. That's ether. Practically speaking, one is the other without the water in it. And by the way, this is just a personal thing for those of you who are parents. You do not, you cannot teach your children how to drink. And if they are teenagers, your capacity to teach them is long gone anyway. What you have to give your children, number one, is a sense of values and proper attitudes. And then you hope to God that when they hit their teen years, when they will choose, that they choose responsibly. And that's what you have to give your children. Attitudes and a sense of values. That's it. Well, how do I teach my children to drink? You don't. When I'm asked that question, I say probably the same way you're teaching to use goofballs. This is a drug. Now, it comes in beverage form. Please remember that. God gave it to us in that form. It is simply what it is. You don't use this information to scare kids with the fear tactic. It will not work. They know that most people who drink do not become alcoholics. They'll turn you off like that. Anyway. The first thing we feel with alcohol is the first paradox about its nature. It's a liquid that dries out your throat. 
Now, for those of us who know it all, did you ever say here, wet your whistle? Well, it doesn't. It dries your whistle. The chaser wets your whistle. That's why we invented it. That's why we invented a mixed drink. To do away with the unpleasant burning sensation caused by the dryness and the irritation, and also to make it somewhat palatable. Now, if you don't, of course, beer and wine have a kind of a minor percentage of alcohol. It's, it's the spirits, you know, that the hurt. <laughs> now, if you've never experienced that, try it with a straight shot when you go home. Or if you don't care to, go to a football game and watch the reaction. There's some clown up in the stands with a half pint, and he takes a big smash, and you get, Oh, that was good! That is the tears were streaming down his cheeks and so Well, that's what happens. It dries out the mucous membranes of the throat because it's highly absorbent of moisture, and it causes us irritation here. However, after a while, you'll feel good, then you don't mind the burning. Now, why do you feel good when you drink alcohol? What is not oxidized by the liver gets into the bloodstream. And the blood ultimately brings it to the brain where it begins to sedate it. How do we know? Simple observation. Dr. Green is not teaching anything here. He's pointing out to you what you already know. Let me ask you this. Do you know when you're in a room full of people drinking? It's obvious, isn't it? Somebody very drunk staggers. And by the way, alcohol is noticeable. I just can't buy this stuff. People say, you know, I know a guy drinks 18 gallons a day and you'd never know it. Well, you'd probably never know it because you've never seen him sober. They say, you ever hear that story, and I'm sure the Navy men here are familiar with it, the, the fellow, the, the first mate or whatever, who keeps the log. The captain was drunk today, the captain was drunk today. This went on for years, so the captain discovered it. He says, don't put that in there, so the fellow didn't. So I think it was eight years later, there was an entry one day, I think it was July 13th. The captain was sober today. Yeah. <laughs> You feel good when you drink because alcohol knocks out of the picture what would make you feel bad. This is why it's a marvelous escape from your problems. This is why. And people feel good. You can see it. You can see it. And here is where you see it. Do you ever see a drunk try to light a cigarette? It's a major production. To watch him zero in on the end of that thing. But before he gets drunk, in Canada, one of the finest films on alcohol is a thing called .08, about blood alcohol level. They use professional racing drivers. They gave them two shots. That's it. Put them behind wheels of cars. And then they had to go through one of these obstacle courses. These are professionals. Professionals. And one man was actually cussing himself because he's not in pylons over. He felt he was functioning well, but he wasn't. And this has to do not with alcoholism. This has to do with you who drink. You do not function better with a couple of drinks. Because you feel you function better doesn't mean you do. Well, I drive better after a drink or two. No, you don't. You drive more relaxed. You do not drive better. There's that split second difference. Getting your foot from the accelerator to the brake. There's that leaving of the hand, getting the key in the ignition. Well, we notice it. We can see it in people, that slowness of the blinking of the eyelids. And then you know, with the motor activity affected, the tongue gets a little, a little bit thick, just ever, ever so slightly. Now we smell that, but that's the way it hits people who drink it. This is what, here's a fellow who comes home from work. Now he's not really a drinker, but they're celebrating something. He's with some of the fellows, and he has about nine. Well, of course, he walks in an hour and three quarters late. The dinner is burned. She's furious. She says, you've been drinking. He stands there swaying. And this is all, uh, um, I mean, just, just, how can you stand, stand there with your face hanging out that way and uh, accuse me of drinking? He thinks he's functioning perfectly. So do you when you drink. So do you when you drink. Now watch. We see funny behavior in drinkers because the emotions are now up here. All right? And... Previously, intelligent people are now saying real nutty things and repeating themselves. Now, if you want to know what I mean, go to the next cocktail party and don't drink. After about three quarters of an hour, you either want to throw up, go home, or get drunk yourself just to take it. Significant is this. Please remember it. After a couple of drinks, you know, we think we've discovered truth serum. It's been around for centuries. It's called booze. And the Latins, 8,000 years before Christ, had an expression, in vino veritas, in wine there is truth. If you want to know what somebody drinks, give him four, well, nobody thinks, give him four or five drinks. Uh, in other words, 
fear is out of the way, the inhibitions are gone, but you're not yet down here. And so you talk freely. However, after a few more drinks, now watch, please. When the emotions come out, they come out drug affected. They come out drug affected. We are looking at goofy emotional behavior. Now let me ask the same question that we left out before. How many of you have ever looked at a problem drinker and said, he needs a psychiatrist? And how many people in high places have spent fortunes on valuable personnel sending them to psychiatrists who are very wise by... Tr well, no, that's neither here nor there. But just let me ask you, what do you think of a psychiatrist who would never dream of trying to treat somebody on the influence of ether but tries to drink actively practicing alcoholics? This is important. I'm not saying that psych uh, psychiatric therapy isn't necessary. What I'm saying is this, that first, sobriety. He does not need psychiatry now. He needs to get sober to find out if he needs a psychiatrist. How would you know whether a patient on an operating table needs psychiatry for his personal, emotional, and mental problems? You say, for God's sake, get the ether out of him and examine him. It's the same way with the alcoholic. Get the drug out of Good Lord, he's been bathing his brain in a drug for 15, 18 years. He needs sobriety to find out to find out if he needs psychiatric care for his emotional problems. Dr. Green has said this, I have seen borderline psychoses clear up with sobriety. It is not whether or not he needs it. Some alcoholics do. In fact, Dr. Green and everyone who has ever done a study on it has found out that the percentage of alcoholics who do need psychiatric attention is exactly the same as the percentage of the non-alcoholic population. About 7 to 10% of all people need care. So, the conclusion, in the initial stages of recovery, psychiatry is contraindicated. Get him sober first. Dr. Green used to say, of those who do need care, he put it semi-crudely, but truly. If you were nuts before you started to drink, you'll be a little flakier after you quit, and you will need subsequent care. All right? With the emotions on top, Affected by the drug alcohol, this is what we see. Whatever you are basically here, exaggerated. There's the jocose type. The life of the party. Very shy. Can't get through his own name, making an introduction. Give him five drinks, he's on the piano, leading the songs. There's the bellicose type. The little teeny fella with the Julius Caesar complex. Very quiet, very subdued, very shy, very diffident. Give him eight or nine bangs of this liquid moral courage, and he's going to challenge the entire bar. As we say in AA, you can spot them. They're usually the new men with the new teeth. <laughs> then there's the lacrimose or crying drunk. Go and met one. <laughs> uh, if you'd like to, you put on a Roman collar and get on a train. You get in the last seat, way back as far as you can get. And after the train pulls out of the station, about three minutes later, some clown steps in from the club car and he spots that one square inch of white. Many a drunk who is very drunk can't quite focus. They tell one of a drunk going down the street and two nuns walking up. They didn't know what to do because he was staggering. But when they got near him, they separated and went around him, and he stopped and said, now, how'd she do that? Of course, you can't, he can't quite focus, but he... Anyway. <clears throat> you may or may not get sick as you drink. That's neither here nor there. You do not have to get sick. But if you drink enough, you will pass out. Three paradoxes about alcohol. It's a liquid that dries out your throat. It is a sedative that seems to stimulate. And it's an anesthetic that can't anesthetize. Precisely because it's a liquid, it must be drunk. And when you drink down to unconsciousness, you can't pick up the glass to get you down to here. How then does alcoholism kill? Through cirrhosis, through malnutrition, and all that they give birth to. And also, oddly enough, a doctor told me this about two weeks ago. He said many an alcoholic will choke to death on his own vomit. He'd be lying on his back and just regurgitate a little bit of his supper and choke to death on him. And secondly, or lastly, by accidents. Alcohol really kills through accidents. Coming out of it, the drinker goes through the same process in reverse. Pre-anesthesia, nauseated. You'll undergo an excitement stage, but will not experience euphoria. Very briefly, before we come to the end of this segment, let's look at two people who go through this process. 
Charlie and his Aunt Mabel show up for a New Year's Eve party. Now, Charlie's the alcoholic. Watch. He burns his throat, feels good for a while. He's the life of the party. He changes into Filthy McNasty. Somebody bangs him in the mouth. He cries in his beard and passes out at 11.30. This is significant, ladies and gentlemen. He did not intend to be unconscious at midnight. He intended to see the New Year in. But he's out. What do you do with a drunk? This is very quick and it's very practical. You put him in the car. His. Um, there's a very practical reason for this. Most alcoholics do not eat because they cannot. But it is a New Year's Eve party, and there's the traditional pickled herring. He's nibbling all this stuff. There are raw oysters, deviled eggs, 92,000 cheese dips, nuts and pretzels and so And it's all sloshing around with the V.O. here. Now about 3.30 out in the car, the cold is going to wake him up. He will then sit up, wake up, and throw up. You make sure it's on his upholstery. Never put a drunk in your car. And I'm, I'm serious about this. The second thing is... He undergoes the excitement stage, and at about quarter to four, everybody's ready to go home, and here's Charles at the door. I want a drink. Now, you've heard that. And guess what the wife always says? Charles, you've had enough. Here's where two people say to each other what two animals wouldn't. Dr. Green's second piece of advice is the most normal, natural, and intelligent in the world. He says, what they do in the hospital? <sighs> Knock him out with more pieces for heaven's sake. Give him the drink. Make sure it's that big. For two reasons, and they're very solid. Number one, he'll get it. And number two, he's got the keys of the car in his hand. He's going to drive. Millions, literally millions, are now being spent trying to reduce alcohol-related highway crashes. Over 50% of the carnage is caused by alcoholics, and over 50% of pedestrians killed are alcoholics. All right, now Charlie's out of the way. Let's look at his Aunt Mabel. There's one in every family, ladies and gentlemen. She's strong-willed. She can't understand his addiction because she doesn't have it. And most non-alcoholics can't. Just they can't. It's like me and gambling. I do not understand gambling. I can grasp it up here, but down in here it means nothing. I just can't. I don't understand it. There are five addictions, you know: narcotics, alcohol, food, and then the two purely psychological ones: gambling and work. Have you ever gone to a lady's house and champions the ashtray seventeen times? Seriously, and you don't smoke. Um. <laughs> but anyway, Mabel, watch Mabel. Mabel is strong-willed. She's got all the questions. Charles, where's your self-respect? He's been looking for it for years. Why don't you drink like other people? <sighs> this is at the heart of the matter. He tries and can't. She's the type who wakes up in the morning, looks at her hair in the mirror, and says, part. And it does. <laughs> it does. Now watch her. She doesn't drink. They sneak a screwdriver into her. Well, okay, this glass of orange juice, Mabel. She drinks half of it. You look at her 20 minutes later, she's over there with a stupid grin on her. <laughs> she doesn't know what it is. Three hairs are out of place and her foot's tapping time to music. And in the middle of the second drink, she passes out. Both of them drank down to... By the way, most people who drink, drink down to here for euphoria. They get it, and that's the way they drink till they die, with perhaps an occasional drunk thrown in. It's no more problem to them than man the moon. Now, here are two people who drank down... To here. Charlie's the alcoholic. Now, what is an alcoholic? And we'll go into the uh, symptoms now. So if you want to take a break now, why we can do it. Okay? Everybody here also has some definition of alcoholism in mind. Everybody does. And usually, as with addiction, our definition of alcoholism will be descriptive. And it'll be based on your past knowledge. Most of them, I think, would be true and accurate. But Dr. Chaffetz found out from having done a study up at Massachusetts General Hospital trying to find why so few alcoholics were being diagnosed in the emergency, discovered that one of the three major reasons was this. Where the patient's drinking pattern paralleled that of the examining doctor, he was not an alcoholic. And I'll bet you cash that those of you who are having trouble with your drinking will give a descriptive definition that will not include you. If you're a weekend drinker, isn't it obvious that an alcoholic somebody drinks every day? If you get drunk occasionally, isn't it obvious that an alcoholic is somebody that's drunk all the time? If you drink daily, isn't it true that an alcoholic is somebody drinks in the morning and you don't? Etc., etc. An alcoholic is someone whose drinking causes serious life problems. It's that simple. It is just that simple. 
And again, I think that the validity of any statement can be seen in the stupidity of its opposite. Let me ask you this seemingly crazy question. Do any of you know or have you ever heard of a person, man, woman, or child, who has ever wrecked an automobile, totaled it, and nearly killed himself as a result of eating string beans? Have you ever heard of that? We've all known people who have nearly killed themselves because they were drunk. Now, you can wreck a car for many reasons, but if alcohol is the reason, alcohol is a problem. Face it, I can't prove this. It's a self-evident truth. To prove, you step behind and show something up in a clearer light. I can't prove this. What makes problems is one. I can't prove that. You buy it or you don't. Let me, again, describe. There's a young fellow in Jessup's Cut. He is serving 20 to life. He has no left arm. Started to go to AA meetings because his cellmate did, that's all. Wanted something to do. He had no more notion of alcohol, alcoholism, than the moon. For a while there, he heard, what makes trouble is trouble, and if your alcohol causes trouble, it's a problem with you. This boy got drunk three times in his life. The first time he lost his arm, the second time he lost his family, and the third time he committed a crime that lost him his freedom. He concluded correctly he's an alcoholic. But how many of you have ever looked at someone in the family, someone you work for, someone who works for you, and said this totally insane thing? Well, yeah, he drinks, but he's not that bad yet. Now, he's not what bad yet? He's not what bad yet. He waited he's dead and perhaps concluded he had a little trouble with his drinking. This is the insanity of behind misinformation in this field. There is no field on earth in which the half-truth results in more tragedy than this one. If you, honest to heavens, believe that alcoholism is a disease, then it's diagnosable and treatable some symptoms of alcoholism. And if you know a few of these, you can write the rest of the story on any alcoholic that you know. It's just a question of details. Hold on to your chairs. All alcoholics drink too much. You say, well, good heavens, I know that. <clears throat> this characterizes all alcoholics, an excessive drinking pattern. Now let me ask you this, how much is too much? Ooh. See, it doesn't have to do with any constant amount. It's purely relative. Too much is however much is too much for you. That's too much. And too much is what makes problems. Let me show you. We call alcoholism a disease of mind. Here's the way he functions. And please bear this in mind all the way through. He can get the troops out of Vietnam in three weeks. Ask him, why didn't the president call me? He can't get out of bed. But he's going to get troops out of Vietnam. He can solve world problems. Can't handle his own. I knew a psychiatrist in Detroit. He used to treat alcoholics and he was good. But in between patients, he'd reach into the door and boom, it's the only way he could get through the day. The problems? Blackout. Just as all people, addicts and non-addicts, will be affected by ether, all people are going to be affected by alcohol. Now, alcoholics and non-alcoholics can experience blackouts. But tell a non-alcoholic, fairly normal person, who can't remember last night but who has a dent in his right front fender, that he may have hit somebody, he'll never drink and drive again. The alcoholic drinks and drives all the time. A blackout, by the way, by the way, is present inability to remember something done recently under the influence. You can remember graduating from grammar school 900 years ago and can't remember last night. I know a woman over in Baltimore married to a man who was up for promotion to general. At 3 a.m. during the Christmas holidays, her daughter, home from college, found her passed out in the bedroom, uh, bathroom floor. It embarrassed her for about 30 seconds. This lady blacks out every time she drinks, beginning at 4 p.m. every afternoon of her life. She has no recollection at all of every evening that she drinks, and it's daily. This no more faces her in the man the moon. She's sick. This is way down here. Gulping and sneaking drinks. If a man were to see his wife, sneak into the bathroom, lift the lid off the toilet tank, pull out a bottle of milk and drink three shots, he'd have her committed in about five minutes. <laughs> now, he drinks alcohol this way. That's why he drinks alcohol. And it never dawns on him, this is different from normal people. Loss of control. 
in whatever degree. Why, he was drunk at his daughter's graduation. Of course he was. He said he was only going to drink three. He drank 23. He is more baffled than you. And so when you ask him why, he comes up with alibis. He has an alibi system. You know what an alibi is? It's an unreasonable reason for doing something. What'd you get drunk last Monday night for? He says it rained. You say, how about Tuesday? He says it didn't. Or it's the people I work with. It's my wife's big mouth. It's the dog's birthday. My team won or my team lost. Whatever. Now, we laugh at the alcoholic's alibis. Now, listen to the professional man's. Well, he's drunk because he has an inferiority complex. He's drunk because he's afraid of authority. He's drunk because he was born in the slums. He's drunk uh, because his mommy abandoned him when he was three. He's no such a thing drunk for those reasons. That's the professional man's alibi system. I don't mean to ridicule it. Don't mistake me. We'll try to clear this up a little bit later. But his reasons for the alcoholic's drinking are somewhat valid because they did play a part in the alcoholic's contracting the disease. That's not why he's drunk today. Anyway, <clears throat> the eye-opener. The need of a drink after a period of deprivation. Please notice it's not called the morning drink, because many an alcoholic has read somewhere, if you drink in the morning, you're in. So you know what he does? He shakes to pieces till noon. Because all disease depends on a wristwatch. We call it the eye-opener, the need of a drink after a period of being deprived of it. Sleep. So normally the eye-opener is in the morning. Drinking alone. To hide the frequency and the amount. He doesn't want you to know he drinks as much as he does as often as he does. That's why he shows up with about 12 miniatures in his pocket. Old weak bladder Willie. He's the guy in the office who goes to the to the bathroom about 82 times between arrival and lunch. And he comes back a little more woozy after each trip. Did you ever catch anybody? At, this is why he gulps and sneaks. He doesn't want you to see him drink. Did you ever walk into a kitchen at a party, you know, hear some clown there with a bottle in his hand? Hi there. Hello. He's embarrassed. He's caught. At, are normal people embarrassed at taking a drink of whiskey? No such thing. He is, because he doesn't drink normally. He doesn't drink normally. That's not normal drinking. Change the pattern. I've got to do something about my drinking, so he switches from bourbon to scotch, to vodka, to beer. Let me show you what I meant in the beginning by lack of knowledge of this thing. There's one difference between a beer alcoholic and a whiskey alcoholic. There's the same amount of alcohol in 12 ounces of beer as you'll find in an ounce of whiskey. Simply means you've got to drink more and go to the bathroom more often. And it's not worth it. Especially on these cold winter nights. They tell one about a man who bought a beer, went in the men's room, and just uh, flushed it down in John. Somebody said, you lost your mind? He said, no, he's just sick and tired of being the middle man. <laughs> Antisocial behavior. Let's put it this briefly and this simply. Have you ever said of someone you know, he's a wonderful fellow when he's sober? Best worker when he's here. That's it. Now, what do we mean by antisocial? Many parties are enhanced by inviting some specific person who gets half slopped up and entertains everybody. Not obnoxious at all. He's simply funny. There's a difference between standing on a piano and leading the songs and busting into a neighbor's house on a Saturday afternoon after 19 rounds of golf and hopping up on his piano with your golf shoes on and then puking on his rug. This is gross, and this is frowned upon. This is antisocial and has repercussions. Loss of friends, jobs, and families. I am not so much of a fool as to think that these things can't happen as a result of many other things. But if they result from one's drinking, then that's alcoholism. And please, I beg you, if you remember nothing else, alcoholism is a family disease, and those who live with it get as sick or sicker than the alcoholic, and they need treatment. Let me show you what I mean, and I don't say this for shock value. A couple hours, kids in our high schools are going to be down the cafeteria eating lunch. 
and at too many tables where they're talking about some game they saw the night before or some lesson they just had in class. There's going to be one kid down at the end with his face down in the soup. He's saying nothing. Guess what happened in his house last night? At 2.30 in the morning, he was shaking to pieces, listening to his dad, calling his mother a goddamned whore in the midst of a drunken rage. Now, this happens in your block. What happens in the heart of a little eight-year-old girl who comes home from school with a classmate, and there's the mother, stark naked, passed out in the middle of the dining room floor, drunk. They don't get over these things. They can't ventilate them with anyone. Most alcoholics recovered in AA are children of alcoholics, and I don't think because they inherit it. I think they inherit attitudes caused by their experience with an alcoholic. I have met women who have said to me, I've heard it so often, Father, I'm beginning to believe it myself. I don't know what I am. First of all, they, they, they're guilt-ridden because they blame themselves for the husband's drinking. This is fantastic. Alcoholism is indeed a result of a combination of causative factors. It's not biochemical purely. It's not psychological or psychiatric purely. It's not emotional purely. It's a combination of all these things, and they differ with the individual. Alcoholism, in turn, is productive. It's a symptom, but it's not just a symptom. That's the half-truth. Because with this goofy word symptom in mind, we have focused on the causes and not the problem. Two men. One, a New York stockbroker, and the other, a physician surgeon from Akron, Ohio, said, let's treat the alcoholism. And they did, and they found out what it was causing cleared up when it cleared up, and now they were able, with proper therapy, to face life without the chemical. How many of you have discussed the drug problem with a drink in your hand? <laughs> the most overused drug on earth is alcohol. It's alcohol. Anyways. Doctors and hospitals. If you've got cirrhosis, drink again and you'll die, so he stays sober out of fear. But when he drinks again, after a protracted, prolonged period of sobriety, he winds up on a bender or a binge, and he wonders what happened. Remember what I said in the beginning? Addiction is characterized by compulsive use, and once contracted, it progresses till death. When an alcoholic, after 10 years of sobriety, drinks again, he does not begin at the beginning, and he does not pick up where he left off. He picks up where he would have been if he had been drinking all that while. Why is this? Nobody knows. It's simply an infallible fact. So the alcoholic can't stay sober five years and drink. At the punch bowls, brink let the wise man think what they say in Japan. First the man takes a drink, then the drink takes a drink, then the drink takes the man. He's sober eight years, and he says this to himself, I'm a man, I can handle a beer. But all addiction goes from the lesser amount to the greater amount, from the lesser drug to the greater drug. He does handle a beer, and he may for a week. But sooner or later, he's going to handle two, and then five. And he handles five shots, and a few days later, a fifth and a half handles him. Tremors, the inner shakes and screaming for a drink, is indicative of a positive cellular craving for the drug without which he cannot operate normally. This is an infallible sign of addiction. And ladies and gentlemen, that is why alcoholics drink. They don't drink because it rained or didn't, nor do they drink because of an inferiority complex. Darn it, that caused the drinking. But they drink today as a result and symptom of their illness. In other words, and briefly, and those of you who are writing can write it down, alcoholics drink because they are alcoholics. The Ill, it's the nature of alcoholism to use compulsively alcohol. In other words, alcoholics drink because they can't not drink. It's perfectly true that an alcoholic's freedom is missing and gone between drinks 10 and 11. I maintain that he's not free before the first drink. The farther away the alcoholic is from his last drink, the closer he is to his next one. It is simply a question of time. And when it happens, we get down to here to try to explain it. The explanation is in the nature of his addictive nature. Protect the supply. If you know any Bite Hides bottles, you know an alcoholic. 
People don't hide milk. They don't hide orange. Remember days of wine and roses? This kid hid one from himself. He hid it and then blacked out. Unreasonable resentments. Here's a wife been living for 15 years for this, and she's, she's totally bewildered now. If I say yes, I'm wrong. If I say no, I'm wrong. See, he's running out of alibis, and he needs a reason to drink. He's drinking compulsively, tremendously now. He doesn't know why, and he's getting flaky. So he comes home, and he provokes her to anger. And when she yells, he drinks. He resents unreasonably. Nameless fears and anxieties. The louder the mouth, the scared of the man. Alcoholism teaches one thing to its victims, how to be scared. So we come to the end of the line. The collapse of the alibi system. The tragedy for 35 out of 36. Death occurs before it does. You know what that is? It means the alibis disappear. I didn't get drunk last night because the Colts won or lost. They didn't play. I didn't get drunk because of her big mouth. She's gone. It's not the people I work with. I don't work. And it's not the dog's birthday. He's dead. I drank because I couldn't help it. I had to drink. He has looked into the mirror of self and seen what is there. He reaches his moment of truth. The insanity of our reasoning. Is it true to say you can't help an alcoholic until he wants it? Yes. Perfectly true. He will not respond to treatment until he wants to. All I'm saying is get him into treatment. Try to make him want to. That's all. You know what I'm saying in effect? I'll wait till he asks for help. God in heaven, I'm looking at a man with a sick mind and asking him to make a major decision about his life. I am presuming the very health of mind that he needs and doesn't have. You can lead a horse to water and not make him drink. Good gracious, I know that. But you can lead him there and make him thirsty. Get him into treatment and see if he'll respond. Okay, but what might work, might work. Let me ask you this. How many of you have ever walked down the street on a beautiful spring day about a half hour before lunch and said, gee, i got a half hour. I think I'll go in that dentist's office and have a few teeth out. We don't function that way. How can we expect an alcoholic to say, I think I'll do something about my drinking problem until he says, I've got one. And if he doesn't know he's got one, it's up to us to make him see it. Uh, how about seeking treatment, buddy, or seeking a new job? <laughs> you know, like that. If he surrenders to his addiction, he winds up incarcerated insane or dead or he can surrender to help. There are clinics, there is psychiatry, there is psychology, and I beg you, don't undersell the virtue and the value and the place of a return to one's religious faith as a component of complete recovery. But above all else, what works best or most is AA. Face it, ladies and gentlemen, ain't a thing on God's good earth that works or succeeds like success. Nothing. It is 12 principles by which to live based on the first three. I can't handle it. God can. I believe I'll let him. It has worked to the tune of one half million people. The programs that you will set up in heaven's name, use the resources you have available, the professionals who know what in God's name they are talking about. Tons of money are being dumped into drug abuse, and I think we know nothing about drugs, nothing. And we spin wheels and get a lot of screwballs heading up these things. Forgive me, I don't mean to be stepping on individual toes. I'm just calling facts. Use people who know something about alcoholism to help in this. And I might leave with these few thoughts. Number one, to me, an educated man is one who has learned after a number of years to say, I don't know. I don't have all the answers. We need many people to do it. There are guidelines for industry. 
that have been found to be workable. In heaven's name, find them out. Secondly, you have been more than kind. I appreciate more than you know you're having me here to talk. I hope for those of you who can still drink that I didn't spoil your drinking for you. And if ever you meet somebody who doesn't have a smile on his face, give him one of yours. Thanks very kindly. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.